Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Jeff Huber, Contributing Editor at Chemical Engineering News, and I will be moderating today's event. This webinar is titled Introduction to Self-Service DNA Encoded Libraries, or DEL, and is being sponsored by Wuxi AppTech. CNN works with sponsors to identify topics of interest and value to CNN's audience and consistent with CNN's mission to provide news and analysis of the chemistry enterprise in a timely, accurate, and balanced fashion. During the webinar, you can adjust the size of the slides on your screen by grabbing the lower right corner with your mouse. If you need technical assistance, please look at the Help widget at the bottom of the screen or type your query into the Q&A box. If you are disconnected during the webcast, please log in again according to the instructions you received earlier. You are encouraged to contribute to the success of this webinar by asking questions at any time during the presentation through the Q&A box on your screen. The questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. As your moderator, I'll be posing as many as time permits. Please note that CNN does not endorse any company, products, or services that may be mentioned in this webinar, and that each webinar will be archived at CNN online after the live webcast. The presentation today is being sponsored by Wuxi AppTech. Wuxi AppTech is a global pharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical, and medical device open access capa capability and technology platform company. As an innovation driven and customer focused company, Wuxi provides a broad and integrated portfolio of services to help its worldwide customers and partners shorten their discovery and development time and lower the cost of drug and medical device R&D through cost effective and efficient solutions. With capabilities such as small molecule R&D and manufacturing, cell therapy and gene therapy R&D and manufacturing, and medical device testing in small molecule R&D and manufacturing, biologics R&D and manufacturing, cell therapy and gene therapy R&D and manufacturing, medical device testing, and molecular testing and genomics, Wuxi is enabling more than 3,000 innovative collaborators from more than 30 countries to bring innovative healthcare products to patients and to fulfill Wuxi's dream that, quote, every drug can be made and every disease can be treated, end quote. During the presentation, we will hear from Dr. Alex Satz. Dr. Satz has 14 plus years experience building and leading DNA encoded library, otherwise known as Dell platforms, and is currently the senior director of Dell strategy and operations at Wuxi AppTech. Prior to joining Wuxi AppTech, Alex built and led Roche Dell Platform in Basel, Switzerland, and Nutley, New Jersey, and helped to develop the first industrial scale Dell Platform at Praesis Pharmaceuticals. Alex has also worked as a medicinal chemist at AstraZeneca, was an NIH postdoctoral fellow at Harvard Medical School, and earned his PhD in organic chemistry from the University of California, Santa Barbara. In the field of Dell, Alex has authored 14 peer-reviewed articles and two book chapters. And with that, I will now hand things over to Alex. Okay, great. Thank you, Jeff, for the kind intro. And thanks, of course, to all of you who are dialing in now to hear about the self-service Dells offered by Wuxi. That's what I'm going to talk about. I've got a lot of slides, so I will go ahead and jump in. Um, if you care about what I look like, that's my picture on the top right hand of this slide. Uh, and I would like to point out that the Wuxi Delt team is over 130 large, and so the effort is quite real, and we are uh, very much want to find hits for others so that they can find drugs. So we work in the field of Dell. We make Dells, we screen Dells, and we find hits. And so I want to take a few slides to talk about what these Dells are. So a single Dell member is shown here on this slide. And on the right-hand side of this, we see the barcode. And the sequence of the barcode encodes the chemical structure, which is shown on the left-hand side. And joining the structure to the bar barcode is a flexible linker. So how are these Dells made? Uh, they're made by what is called split and pool combi chem. So I'm going to go through a quick example here. So circled in red is a mixture of three different things. Each one has a barcode where the sequence encodes what the chemical structure is on the other side. 
And if we take this mixture of three different things, we can split it equally amongst three different tubes. And in each one of these tubes, we're going to add a BB and a tag. And the unique tag is, do, is going to encode what the BB was that we added to that specific tube. And in this way, we're going to start with a split of three different tubes and we're gonna make nine different structures. So the split was a split size of three, and the nine different structures which are then formed, we can then pool again into a single tube. And in theory, we could take a single thing, a single structure from that mixture of nine, amplify its tag, and from the sequence of the tag, we know what the structure was. Now, when we make DELs, though, we don't use split sizes of three. We use split sizes that are much larger. So, for instance, we could use a 96-well plate, and we could have a split size of 96. And we could go through four cycles of 96-well plate splits. And 96 to the fourth power would give us 85 million different chemical structures. Now, another thing that we could do instead is instead of using a single 96 well plate per split is we could use 99 96 well plates per split. So now every split is 9,000 in size and we could just do two, 9,000 by 9,000, which would still give us a lot of different structures. And so in this manner, a single chemist can make a lot of different structures in just a few weeks in a very cost efficient manner. And what that allows us to do is to make a kit. And in our kit, we're going to have four different tubes. And each one of those tubes can contain an identical copy of 14 billion different encoded structures. And what that allows us to do, because there's four identical copies, is that we can run four screens side by side, all at the same time. So let's talk about what the screen is, what the Dell screen is. It's basically a binding assay. So you need about 100 micrograms of protein, which is not a large amount, and you immobilize it onto a solid phase resin. And you take your Dell from one of these tubes and you add it. Now, some members of the Dell will bind to your target but most things won't. And the stuff that doesn't bind, you just wash those things out. And what you're left behind with are the structures that bind to your target. You then elute those by running heated buffer over the target. The target will denature a bit. Now the binding pocket is gone. And as you can see in the right panel, you end up with the sequence, which you amplify and decode, which tells you the structures of the ligands that bound to your target. Now, what's nice about a Dell screen is that it takes one person one day to run this screen. And so the purpose of running these Dell screens, as others have found out and shown, is that you can get Dell hits from them which bind to your target and which can then be advanced in, order, in either in vivo POCs or can go all the way into the clinic and end up in phase two. But there is a bit of a problem here. You might have a target, which is great, and you could screen it and find hits, and those hits, maybe you could turn them into drugs. But the problem is the people who own the Dell screening platforms won't allow you access to the screens. And so if you're somewhat frustrated by the fact that you have targets, but you can't run screens, you are not alone in this. And so Richard Lerner and Sidney Brenner have published a paper, which in part they talk about ways in which people with targets could use Dell screening in order to find hits, especially in the academic world. And we at Wuxi have partnered with them. And I show you here, the Dell Open webpage, which you can go to. 
You can see who is on the advisory board, and you can learn more about Dell Open that we do. It's for academics only, and it is basically completely free. So this is a way that academics with great targets can get the hits that they need to maybe do a startup, publish a paper, and or find a drug. And I'll talk about this more. So from a higher level, what is the Wuxi Dell screening business model? So we have our normal selection package, which I've circled here in red. And in that package, you send your target to us and we screen it. But the webinar that I'm talking about right now is about the self-service Dells. So that's gonna be, for instance, Dell Light, which everyone has access to. So if you're a startup, an academic, or any, anything else, you can use this. It contains 51 Dells, 14 billion different structures. And the key to Dell Light is that the physical screen is done by you and your lab, and the target remains something which Wuxi does, does not know. So the target is not shared with us. I'm gonna talk more about it later. For academics, we have Dell Open, which essentially is completely free for an academic user, and again, the screen is done in your lab. All right, so I'm gonna talk about the Dell Open workflow first, and then I'm gonna talk about the Dell Light workflow. So in the Dell Open workflow, first the researcher, or you, goes to the Dell Open webpage and you order a free kit. And you also watch the video which shows you how to conduct a Dell screen. When the kit arrives, you run the screen, but then you send the physical samples back to Wuxi when you're done. And we do the PCR, the sequencing, the informatics, and we give a report back to you, which allows you to know how the screen turned out. But the structures themselves are not shown to you. At this point in time, you can have Wuxi synthesize up to five compounds for you. You have to make, you have to pay though to have those made. And then the compounds are shipped to you. You still don't know what the structures are, but then you are free to assay them as you wish. If the compounds are active, if you like what they're doing, then the result is going to be that you're gonna end up owning those hits. The structures will be given to you and you will be free to patent them, start a company, sell them, or anything else. Wuxi does not maintain any rights to any IP on those hits that we have given to you. Now, this is going to proceed through one of two options. One is called the fee for hits, and this is the one that you probably won't choose, but if you decide that the compounds that you have tested look so great and you feel that they are worth a lot of money, then you might choose to pay Wuxi a fee and to keep all of your data and your target a secret. But you also have an option which is going to be completely free called data for hits. And I'm gonna highlight this on the next slide as to what this means. The purpose of Dell Open is to share stuff so that more papers get out and more people can do things with this data. And so we give you the structures for your five hits, but in exchange, you agree to have your screening data and your target published online in the Dell open space. But note that the five hits that we gave you will be removed from that data set. And also the screening data, which we're gonna put online, will have the structures blinded. However, others could come and see this data and have an interest in the data and in your target. And they can come to you and ask your permission for us at Wuxi to unblind five more structures for them. And then you can collaborate with this other group, publish more, and of course that's our goal, right? That this data leads to as much science being done as possible. And so we call it Dell Open because it's supposed to be open. I want to stress this point, circled here in red, even though I already talked about it, 
and that is the hits belong to you. So the hits that you have synthesized when they're active and you like them and we show you their structures, they are completely yours to do whatever you want to with. All right, so that is the Dell Open workflow, which is for academics only. But here's the Delight workflow, which anyone can use. So in this case, you purchase a kit from us and you do the screen in your lab. You send the samples back to Wuxi. And again, we do the PCR, the sequencing, and we give a report back to you. You look at the report, you talk to us about it, and you decide if you want to pay to unblind all the structures. After the structures are unblinded, you are completely and totally free to pursue all those structures in any way that you would like. And that, in, that includes filing patents, publishing papers, and of course, to discover drugs. So there might be some of you online who discovered a great protein 30 years ago, and it's been sitting in the back of the freezer waiting to be screened. And the question is, is it a good idea to take that protein out of the freezer, let it warm up to room temp, and run a Dell screen on it? And there's been a fair amount of historical data that would say that that probably will not work out well. Um, others have said before I that you get what you screen for, and if you screen protein target where the quality isn't high, then the quality of the screening outcome will probably not be high either. So on the left hand of this slide, I put in a few bullet points about what you want your target to actually be like, and it's important that you have a high concentration of correctly folded target where the binding pocket is there. I would also want to point out that the Dell screen itself is always the same. So the protocol for running a Dell screen itself, other than perhaps minor changes in the buffers being used, the protocol is usually the same. But some Dell screens end up providing hits that go into the clinic and other Dell screens don't provide any use, useful hits. And the difference between these screens is always the quality of the target. So just want to stress that point uh, just to save you time and effort and money. So it's commonly asked, what will the hits from a Dell screen look like? So I put up here five of the first 31 Dells and Dell Open so that you can see what their generic structures of these Dells look like. I personally think it's very hard to look at these generic structures and know what your hits are going to look like. Uh, fortunately, though, there are some published historical data which clearly talks about what hits from a Dell screen will actually look like. And I'll talk about that here in the next slide. So historical data from other Dell screens. This is a case, this is a heat map shown here. There are 40 Dell hits from two different Dell screens. And those 40 Dell hits were compared structurally with all existing published space. And what we found was that the Dell hits generally do not look like existing published space. And so Dell hits are not something which you can go to a vendor and buy. The second question which is often asked is, will all the Dell hits look like each other? So what we did was we took all of, known, all of the known published space and we simplified it to a 2D plot. And we overlaid it with these 40 Dell hits shown in these purple and blue boxes. And as you can see, the purple and blue boxes of these 40 Dell hits are spread out over all of the known published space. And so the conclusion from this is clearly that Dell hits do not look like known things that you can purchase, and they do not look like each other. And if you want more details about, about this, the citation is on the bottom of this slide. 
So I've talked about the workflow of Dell Light and of Dell Open, but and I've talked to you about how a report will be given to you, and from this you're going to make important choices about what to do, but I haven't actually shown you what the report actually looks like. So on the next seven slides, I'm going to show you a report which was made from an in-house test case. So this was a protein target that we just ran as an internal test. So let's take a look at what the first slide of that slide deck is that we would be sending to you after you've done your screen. So first, you have four tubes and you can run four conditions. So just as an example here, condition one circled on the left is your target. And condition four circled on the right is the, is the uh, condition where the target hasn't been added. So in this case, we want to see which structures bind the IMAC column so that we can subtract those out because we don't want to make those structures. The second slide is going to be about QC. So we're going to detail the QPCR that we do on the samples that you send us so that we can make sure that we sequence the best stuff to find the best looking hits. And also, you might be working with a protein which binds DNA. And if you give us the details about that, we can make sure that what we find that is enriching isn't due to that binding event. That's something that we can offer as well. This slide is a generic slide, which is meant to educate you or tell you about what the line plots are that we tend to use. So I'm going to run through this plot. It takes a little bit of time. On the top, we see the Dell number. So the Delight kit, for instance, has 51 Dells. And this Dell here is Dell 139. If you count the lines in this plot, they're kind of this magenta colored lines. You'll see that there are four of them. Each of those lines represent a single structure which was in, enriched. The enrichment level is given on the y-axis, and the x-axis is the condition that the enrichment occurred in. So what's nice about these line plots is that they can show you the enrichment of a structure. For instance, in condition one and two, these structures enrich, but in conditions three and four, they don't which is what you, you would want in this case. There is one drawback to these line plots, and that is they don't tell you much about the chemical SAR. And that is something when you get these reports back, you're going to have to interact with us at Wuxi so that we can help you out there and explain things. So this slide is giving a very broad overview of all the results against many, many different Dells. And it's telling you that almost 25,000 different structures enriched in this screen. There's too much data here to really pull out any specific thing, but it's an overview so that you know that the screen worked. And here we've removed what bound to the IMAC column. So this is in conditions three and four. We've removed that stuff. And what you're left with now is about 3,400 different structures. However, we're going to dig down even further, and we're going to say, well, just show us the ones where the enrichment is relatively high. And that's shown in this middle box with the red circle around it. Now we have about 20 different structures enriched in five different DELs, where the enrichment occurs in conditions one and two but then we can see that the enrichment does not occur in conditions three and four. I would point out that the structures that are, or the lines that are shown in green are the truncated structures that enrich. And then we have the last slide in the uh, report, which would be sent to you, which tells you that you had 14 full-length structures where the enrichment was high, 
and occurred in region A. If you look at region A, that's in the bottom left-hand corner of the VIN, and that is where things enriched in condition one and condition two to the overlap, but they did not enrich in conditions three and four. Now, I think it's useful, since this was an internal test case, I can go ahead and show you some structures. Because I think it's nice to go from the line plot, which can be a little abstract, to seeing real structures drawn out and what they, they mean. So if you look at the plot in the left-hand corner, these are the structures that enriched against Dell 49. If you counted the blue lines, you would count that there were six. And each one of those lines represents a single structure, and each of those structures are shown in the bottom of this slide. The DEL, the generic structure for the DEL, is shown in the upper right. And you have two different BBs at cycle one, one different BB at cycle two, or it's fixed, and two different BBs are occurring at cycle three. So there is some SAR there. We resynthesized one of these structures, and we did find that it does indeed bind to its target. We did a simple mass spec binding screen. Uh, we did not determine an IC50, though. It just binds. So what does the future look like? So Dell as a whole has been moving forward very, very quickly, and we expect that as time goes by, that Dell Lite and Dell Open will continue to get better and better. We have every intent, in, intention to continue to invest in them. That doesn't mean that you should wait 10 more years to run your screen. I think these Dell pools are ready now to find very useful hits. Additionally, the report that I've shown you has the structure blinded out. And so it's hard to see chemistry SAR. So at the moment, with, when these reports are sent to you, you will need to talk to us in order for us to help you understand exactly how you want to move forward. In the future, though, we would like to adjust these so that they're a little more automated, so that partially blinded structures could be shown, and so that calculations could be done which gave you a better feel about what these structures were without actually showing you the detailed structures. And third, well, running DELT screens is a fairly straightforward thing, and it only takes a day. We understand that not everyone necessarily wants to do this. And while this option does not exist currently, in the future we might be able to provide a third party who could run the physical screen for, for you. Um, and we are curious about perhaps doing this in the e EU or in the USA. Okay, and with that, I would like to thank all of you for signing on, and I believe, Jeff, I'm going to answer a bunch of questions now, so thank you very much. Yep, that's right, Alex. Um, we've got some questions that have come in uh, during your presentation, so um, I'm going to uh, go through some of them now. And if anybody is on the line and um, has some more questions, please submit them and we'll uh, uh, post them to Alex here. So let's uh, start off with um, we have a question here that asks, you talked about how broad of a chemical space the Dell compounds cover. Do the compounds still adhere to Lipninsky's rules, or is this a broader battery? Um, I, would, I would say that it is broader. We make these DELs through CombiChem, and so some of the structures we make are relatively small, and some are relatively large, and everything between those two, two points. Of course, what ends up being followed up is going to be up to the person who ran the screen. So if you have no interest in any structure that um, goes into a physical place which you don't like, then you simply wouldn't follow up those structures. Uh, we have another question that asks, if two researchers run the same Wuxi Dell screen and get the same, mostly the same hits, who gets the priority? Do you ever remove compounds from the Dell collection so this won't happen? 
Yeah, so when we're talking about the self-service screening, uh, we at Wuxi don't know what these targets are. So we don't, um, we don't remove hits. Uh, we don't guarantee that other people aren't screening the same targets, and indeed, we don't, we don't know. So that's, that's part of the nice thing about the self-service screening is that Wuxi doesn't know what the targets are. And no matter what your target is, we don't deny you access to be able to run the screen. Another question asks, how do you handle DNA binding protein? Ah, oh, yeah, so there's a couple of different ways. Um, if it binds to a specific sequence, then you should synthesize a large amount of that sequence and spike it into the screen so that your DNA binding protein is bound to it. It blocks that binding site, and then you can run your Dell screen in a normal way. We also offer, as part of Dell Open and Dell Lite, we can do an informatics test to make sure that the enrichment that we're seeing isn't coming about through the interaction with the barcode instead of with the chemical structure. Someone wrote in and asked, do the unblinded structures arise from just binding affinity assays or are functional assays involved too? So the Dell screen itself is based on purely binding. Um, in the case of Dell Light, when you unblock the structures, then you can see all the structures of everything that has been binding to your target. And then you need to follow it up in order to determine, are these potential structures doing what you want in the assays that you run? Um, in the case of Dell Open, uh, and, and I went through this workflow, the compounds are given back to you and you need to test them to make sure that they're doing whatever it is that you want for, for your target. And only in the case where they are doing what you want do you then proceed further. But, you know, the Dell screen itself is a binding screen then. Someone else asks, how long does the analysis take? Ah, so we promote this as taking six weeks. So the turnaround is, is pretty fast. And then uh, kind of related to that, somebody else asked, how long does the post-processing after a library screen take? Uh, so, so, so that's all part of the same process. So when we receive the samples from you, we turn it around. We do the PCR, the sequencing, the processing and the report goes back to you, and that is all done within that six week time frame. Someone else asked many of the academics have startups that are involved, or sorry, that are launched from them. Um, how does this work on the platform selection? Yeah, I, I, I think I know what they mean. So if you're an academic and you have an academic lab, then you can use Dell Open and have the Dell Open kit sent to your lab and you can do the screen in your academic lab. If you don't have an academic lab, then you can't order the Dell Open kit. Now with that said, if you have an academic lab and you have a startup, I would say if you're really serious about finding a drug in the shortest amount of time, then even though Dell Open is free, Delight is probably the better choice. Um, someone else asks, can the Dell be adapted to screen for protein-protein interaction inhibitors? I would say it's, it's pretty natural for doing this. Um, yeah, it's certainly for finding things that bind to a certain protein, Dell is perfect. If you want to make sure that it's binding to an area on your protein, which affects the binding of another protein, then you could always spike that second protein in to see if it competes away the binding of your DEL. So you can both find binders to your target, 
and you can determine if those binders are binding to the surface of the protein where it's interacting with the PPI. Uh, another question asks, any idea of a false positive rate? How often do compounds that show low or average enrichment turn out to actually be potent in biochemical assays? So there's, there's sort of two different questions there. It, the lower your enrichment is, the higher the risk of when you resynthesize the compound that it won't be active. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a false positive, though. Sometimes it's simply a very weak binder. And Dell, when you run a Dell screen, you can enrich things which are very weak binders. Um, from a very practical standpoint, if the screen works well, if the protein is good, about half the compounds you make will usually end up being active in whatever assay it is that you're running. So, so that's, the, that's the practical historical answer. Um, is the protein used full length or truncated? You can use either. Um, Sometimes one gives a result which is better or different than the other, but uh, you have to run the screen in order to find out which that is. Um, if I had to choose one, I would probably go with the truncated version, but it depends what you're looking for. Sometimes you're looking for a binder which perhaps isn't binding in the known active site, and in that case, it might not make sense to screen the truncated version. Um, someone else um, asked, so they say Dell has been historically limited to soluble protein targets. Can you speak to advances in applying Dell to membrane protein targets, such as um, G protein coupled receptors, ion channels? How do you adapt the screening approach? Any particular risks, issues to watch out for, like false positives? Can you speak to your experience in terms of hit rate, success, and failures? So if the protein can be solubilized, then we can run a Dell screen on it, and it's very doable. As far as the historical hit rate goes on solubilized protein targets, um, it's probably a little lower, and I think that's due to the quality of the protein itself. Um, but for the most part, um, I would say if the protein quality remains high, then the screen will go smoothly, and you will find it. Somebody else asked, in your experience with DELS, does the DNA tag ever participate in slash interfere with binding? Well, for instance, if you run a screen against a transcription factor, and that transcription factor binds to a sequence which is contained within the barcode, then you will absolutely enrich that barcode. So I would say that that is um, interfering with the screen. However, we know how to overcome that problem. We simply add extra DNA, which contains that binding site, and we block the transcription factor binding. So uh, can it happen? Yes. But is it a solvable problem? Yes. Um, do you have CNS biased or designed Dell libraries? So the short, short answer is uh, yes. You can always choose a Dell pool where a larger percentage of the compounds in that pool have properties which you feel would be better for a CNS target. Um, with that said, I think what is important about finding hits with the properties that you like is that you screen more compounds that have those properties as opposed to screening fewer compounds that don't have those properties, if that makes any sense. Um, so absolutely, you can make a Dell pool, which is more focused on properties which you would like. Um, what I haven't seen is clear-cut evidence that that yields a result which is better. 
how do you ensure fidelity of individual reactions in the split and pool process? Yeah, so every building block that we use is tested in a model test case before the DEL is made. In addition, while the DEL is being produced, you can test the mixtures to make sure that the reactions seem to be going well. Although that is not a concrete thing, you're dealing with mixtures at that point in time, and it is hard to measure yields in an accurate manner. Most of the QC work for making a, a DEL is done before the DEL is made, and that is why it is very important that the reactions you use when you make DELs work very well and are not, um, are not finicky. Do you have any canaspecific DEL libraries? Oh, could, could you say that one, one more time? Oh, sorry about that, Alex. Do you have any kinase-specific Dell libraries? Oh, oh, kinase-specific. Well, you, you know, so one of the nice things about, about Dell is that it doesn't contain specific moieties that tend to hit kinases. And, and the, what, what makes that a good thing is that the hits that we find tend to be very selective for the kinase that they're screened against. Um, so, I mean, the, the short answer is you could always make a DEL full of motifs that you already know bind to those kinds of targets, but if you were to do that, I think your chances of finding things that were novel and selective would actually be very low, and that tends to be the goal of kinases. It's, it's, the problem there in that field isn't to find things that are active, it's to find things that are novel and that are selective. Do you identify and share information on promiscuous binders that interact with a lot of different proteins non-specifically? So as we run more and more screens, we keep a database of everything that enriches against every other target. And what we generally do is, uh, as time goes by, is we choose to ignore things that enrich against multiple targets. Um, so do we, I, I think it was asked, do we, do we share that information? No, we, we didn't have any intention on sharing it, but we do flag that. So we don't, we don't want to suggest that people follow up a, um, a potential hit, which we see enriched against a lot of other structures. Do you create unique DNA tags for each BB? Or how much are they different from each BB? Hmm. So we create the barcode in a combinatorial fashion in the same way that we're creating the chemical structure. So every building block is encoded by a unique, D, D, a unique tag sequence. Yes. How much protein is required per screen? Typically, it's about 10 micrograms of protein per condition per round. Um, how do you do screening for proteins that are difficult to purify? Oh, well, it's an excellent question. Um, in order for the DEL screen to work well, the protein quality is very important. And I would have to say that if the protein can't be purified, and if the quality can't be high, then the chances of the screen working well are much lower. I, I mean, I can't guarantee that the screen won't work, and I can't guarantee that, that it would work, but um, the better your protein is, the better the outcome of the screen is likely to be. What is the typical affinity that you find in a Dell hit? I, I feel as though that is dependent upon the target. 
more than the Dell screening. Um, I would say that hits that we consider useful tend to be either single digit micromolar or more potent. Um, can we find hits that are less potent than that? Probably yes, but in the end, the follow-up assays that we normally use, um, if they're not single-digit micromolar or better, uh, usually no one has an interest in those kinds of, of um, hits. What is the maximum number of selection conditions that can be run in an experiment? Well, so for, for the self-service Delight and Dell Open, it's four. Um, now, in theory, using Dell and how it's set up, you can run a very large number of conditions. But for in this case, for the self-service Wuxi kits, it's four. Do you run multiple rounds of screening to enrich the hits? Most screens with large libraries have required several rounds to remove nonspecific binders, or do you counter screen or do your counter screens eliminate this requirement? So we require and we ask that you run uh, three rounds. However, you will save some of the sample after the second round. And when you send that back to us, we will do qPCR on both the products of the second round and the third round. And depending upon those results, we will sequence the results from after the second round or the third round. So you will certainly run three, three rounds, and then we will make the choice as to which one is, is the best for the sequencing. Uh, this question reads, whether the binding is at allosteric or orthosteric, is there any mechanism to understand the same? So yes, if you have a positive control that you know binds to the orthosteric site, then you can spike that into to one of the screening conditions in a large amount. You can displace any binders to the orthosteric site, and that will let you know which library members are therefore binding to that orthosteric site. Proving that something is binding to an allosteric site, that can be done in a straightforward manner as well, but only if you have a, a a control which you know binds to that allosteric site. How do you determine between a weak, a weak binding and a non-hit? Hmm. That's tough. Um, so I, I'm not exactly sure how we should define a non-hit. I would just say that as the enrichment level increases, the chances that when you resynthesize that compound and you assay it, the chances that it will be active goes up. If it's a really weak hit, if it's a really weak binder, whether it's a real binder or not, it still won't show up as active in the assay. So in that case, it doesn't really matter. Every target protein could have multiple compound binding sites. Does Dell just screen for the compounds that have highest binding affinity? Now, that's probably a fair assumption. Um, you could certainly, if you had more than one bi binding pocket, you can certainly end up binding binders, even if they're less potent, which is binding to the other binding pocket. But there is a chance that if you have a very nice binding pocket and then you have another, let's say a shallow binding pocket, there is a chance that you would only find binders for the, um, for the better form binding pocket. Um, but, but still that is gonna be target dependent. Um, but yeah, it, it would be, it, it's gonna be hard to find binders against a shallow pocket when there is a nice pocket there as, as, uh, as well. How many cycles do you typically run for a Dell? Do you favor two or three cycle libraries to keep the molecular weight down? So we have all sorts. So we have two, three, and four, but as a general rule, yes, two and three cycle Dells tend to provide hits which are automatically in a better physical property space. 
And here's another question similar. It says, do you focus on two and three cycle libraries or do you have lots of structures from four cycle or bigger libraries? Well, we certainly have a lot of structures from the four cycle DELs, but with that said, um, we have a lot of two and three cycle DELs included in both the DEL Open and the DEL Lite. So it's going to be a mix. This question asks, is it possible to complement an internal DEL collection with Wuxi Delight collection and run the DEL screen with both collections together? Internal collection will be blinded for Wuxi and Wuxi collection will be blinded for the company. Do you know if PCR and sequencing are working mixing two DNA designs in the same pool? Yeah, so we, we pool our Dells together regardless. So the Dell Light collection is a pool. What we wouldn't do is take Dells that exist in the proprietary collection and add them to the Dell Light pool. A, a very nice thing about the Dell Light and Dell Open setup is that Wuxi does not know what these targets are that you're screening. And so it's, it's very different from the proprietary Dells that we make and screen otherwise. So, so a Dell Light kit is something that we send to you. If you want to screen the other Dells that Wuxi has, then the protein needs to be sent to us. Do you have experience with Dells with covalently binding compounds, for example, for protease screens? Um, yeah, the short answer to that is yes, and we do run such screens, although that is not part of the Dell Light kit. Going through here to see, I make sure I got all the questions. Um, did, did it ever happen that after screening, there is no compound to be found? Uh, to, to be found. So, yeah, if, if a protein target isn't of a very high quality, then it can happen that when you run a screen that there's simply nothing that looks good or worth it following up. So that can certainly happen, yes. Are DELs typically more useful with enzymes than GPCRs or ion channels? Uh, could, could you say that one, one more time? Sorry. Oh, yeah. Sorry. That's no problem, Alice. Um, the question was, are DELs typically more useful with enzymes than with G protein Couple receptors or ion channels. Ah, uh, so so it, it's certainly easier to screen soluble enzymes because producing them and purifying them is more straightforward. But if you have purified, sol solubilized ion channels and GPCRs, then the screens can certainly be run in a straightforward manner. Are all molecules resynthesized off DNA to confirm binding or resynthesized on DNA for confirmation? We, we can do both. We can do either. In the case of Dell Open, though, we would be sending you the solid powders of the off DNA synthesized compounds. Um, and that's so that you can test them in the assay of your, your choice. Uh, but yeah, compounds could be made either way. Um, the on-DNA uh, synthesis is a nice touch because if there are, are any byproducts being formed, we can tell what those are and we can test those for binding too. Is it possible to specify the general makeup of the small compound part of the library to focus the Dell on specific chemistry? Hmm. Uh, so uh, if I'm understanding that question correctly, I'll just answer it by saying that, that, that the Dells that we have, they've already been made and they exist in the kits that we send out. And so any ability to pick and choose between which specific structures are going to be screened and which ones aren't, there isn't an option there. You screen all of them all at once. 
Um, what is the molecular weight range of a hit, and can you control up to 300 Dalton? Uh, so the molecular weight range can vary quite a bit. It's often target dependent. Some binding pockets require um, compounds which are fairly large, and, and others require compounds which are small for uh, binding. Um, however, you, as the person who runs the screen and who looks at the data, you always get to choose which structures you're going to follow up. So if you're working on a target or a target class where you need certain physical properties to be true, then you're going to only choose to follow up hits which match the profile that, that you want. Um, what is the guarantee of obtaining a hit that is functionally active? Well, well so these are cases where we don't know what the targets are. So we at Wushu don't know what your target is, and we don't know what your assay is. We also don't know what you're considering to be functionally active because that can change from different project teams. So we don't guarantee that. What we guarantee is the quality of the Dell that we send you, but because you are producing the protein, you're running the screen, and you're setting up the assays, um, all that needs to be guaranteed just by you. Um, we only guarantee the quali quality of the Dell that we're sending. Are there procedures to prepare positive and negative controls while using DELs? Um, yeah, so we, we don't have those written out in detail, but certainly if you needed help with that, that's something that Wuxi will certainly help you do, yes. Do you find that a large number of selection conditions are is useful, or do they overcomplicate the analysis? It's a bit of both. I would say that they probably more often complicate things and lead to downstream problems than they help, but the fact is um, sometimes they can be helpful too. So it's, it's, it's a mixed bag. What is the chance that a code is not representing the correct compound? I couldn't really give you a calculation for what that is. It's one of the um, one of the things that I don't worry about very much, though. I, I generally, the greatest concern is the quality of the target. I mean, that's what makes screens work or makes them not work. Um, how long will sequencing take? Well, so, so the whole thing from the time the samples are sent back to Wuxi and we've run the PCR and we sequence and we process the data and we send it back to you, we promote that to be done in um, six weeks. Um, since the researcher does not know the identity of the hits, how is the decision made to identify the top hit? So we work with them in order to make the best choices there. Uh, we can provide um, a physical profile of what those hits are. We, we can provide a lot of information about those structures. We just can't provide the exact structures. That's in the case of Dell Open. In the case of Dell Light, if you pay to unblind the data set, then you see all of the structures. Can someone without any screening Sorry, can someone without any screening experience be successful doing their own screen? How much time is it going to take? So, yeah, so, um, you know, it's, it's probably going to take you a day to get everything ready. Um, it's it's going to take you a long full day in lab on the second day in order to, like, physically run the screen. Um, so I would, I would, I would assume it's going to take, um, you know, with meetings and everything else to really get it all set up, it's probably going to take you about three days. Um, might even take you longer if you um, really want to watch the video multiple times and maybe even do a few practice runs. Um, can you do it if you've never run a screen? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, our view is that uh, People accustomed to working in a lab can read the protocols that we have, 
watch the video that we've posted and that that yes they should be able to most likely run these screens um, do you find hits have good ligand efficiency and lipophilic efficiency what are the typical ranges it's really all over depending upon the target with some targets we have small really potent hits um, there's been some papers published on, on this, too. Um, for other cases, for certain PPIs where the binding pockets are quite shallow, you know, the hits tend to be larger and the ligand efficiency tends to be lower. So I would say that's not really a Dell-dependent thing. Again, that's really about the target. How important is Q-screening, or sorry, how important is Q-sequencing depth to calculate the enrichment? It's, um, it's relatively important. As the sequencing depth becomes worse and worse, your enrichment, your, your ability to detect your binders gets worse and worse, too. Um, however, we've sort of figured that out, and, and we do know the sequencing depth that we need for Dell Open and for uh, our self-service kit. So we sequence the correct amount, whatever that is. Um, but, but yeah, uh, I, I would say that before um, next generation sequencing, um, doing this kind of Dell screening just wasn't possible. Okay, um, thanks so much, Alex, um, for um, answering all those questions and for giving your presentation. We're at the top of the hour, so I think we're gonna say that's all the time that we have. Uh, thank you again, Alex, for your fascinating presentation. Thank you, participants, for being a great audience. Be sure to check CNN or CNN online for information on the next edition of CNN webinars. Thank you, On24, for technology and production services. And thank you, Wuxi AppTech, for the sponsorship that made this interactive webcast possible. For CNN webinars, I'm Jeff Huber. Have a great day, everyone.